Welcome to the International Peace Institute. I'm Maureen Quinn, Director of Programs. Tonight, we are very pleased to hold the second policy forum in 2013 under the auspices of IPI's Women, Peace, and Security Series. The IPI series is a collaborative effort to highlight women advancing peace processes, as well as efforts to further protect women in conflict and support their roles in the practices of peacekeeping and peacebuilding. Today's topic, gender and peacekeeping, perspectives from the field, offers us the opportunity to discuss peacekeeping and gender, the recent accomplishments made in the field, the challenges ahead, and uh, recommendations for the future. UN peacekeeping missions recognize that women and men experience conflict differently and therefore understand peace differently. Their work is supported by a commitment to the principles of inclusiveness, non-discrimination, -disc gender balance, and efficiency. Tonight we have great panelists with us to learn how this, this commitment, the commitment to these principles, is upheld and the challenges faced in carrying out this work. So welcome to all our panelists. As we begin our discussion, I want to ask our panelists and really all of you in the audience to think about three questions. In the area of United Nations peacekeeping missions, what has worked in the implementations of the United Nations system guidance on women, peace, and security under Resolution 1325? What are the uh, the toughest challenges in this work, and what are the practical suggestions for mobilizing more support for and further positive results in what is a two-part endeavor, an endeavor to, to support the participation and role of women in peacekeeping, as well as to support the interests and security of women and girls in countries and regions where UN peacekeeping missions are present. In today's conflict situations, armed groups often go after those perceived as the weakest or easiest targets in society. <clears throat> and much too often, women and children are at the top of that list. Now I would point out that in this, in the work of certainly of this, this group of panelists here, that nobody ever said this was going to be easy. Yet the accomplishments to date can inspire further progress and understanding the problems can lead to ideas for new approaches and solutions. So now I'd like to turn to our panelists. Um, we've asked each panelist to speak about five minutes, and I'm going to try and uh, keep it to that so we can have a good, a good discussion. Our first panelist is Mr. Gan Ms. Ganelle Curry. Ms. Curry is the Gender and Women's Rights Advisor for the Office of the High Commissioner for, the Human, for Human Rights in New York. In this capacity, she leads the intergovernment and interagency uh, uh, leads the, her office's engagement with New York-based uh, agencies uh, in intergovernment and interagency processes on matters related to the advancement of women to ensure the inclusion of a rights-based perspective. Ms. Curry led the setup of the Women's Pro Protection Advisors in the UN mission in South Sudan as well as the rollout of the monitoring, analysis, and reporting arrangements, known as MARA, in the response to conflict-related sexual, sexual violence. You will have her bio in front of you, but I just mentioned, before joining the United Nations, Ms. Curry worked as a senior officer in the office of the Prime Minister, as well as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Bahamas. So, Ganel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very warm welcome. It is a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you and to have this opportunity to share a little bit about, about my experience um, in setting up the Women Protection Advisors in South Sudan. I, my presentation today basically highlights the value added of um, WPAs. I will go a little bit into the structure that we used in South Sudan and some of the key coordination roles and role um, that the WPAs play, as well as um, some of the work they've done so far in terms of setting up the monitoring analysis and reporting arrangement, um, the MARA. So 
We had a lot of discussions around this as what, what has been the main value added of the WPAs, both with my, with my colleagues in, in, in South Sudan and of course with my colleagues, my key partners here. And I think we keep coming back to the same issue, that the value added mainly is having the specific expertise, dedicated resources, specific expertise, on conflict-related sexual violence. And these specific expertise that understand the issue of monitoring, investigating, analyzing, understanding, strengthening and the, and strengthening the appropriate integrate, integrated UN responses. So if you have those dedicated responses, those dedicated resources, those persons on the ground who understand the issue, not just in a general sense, but actually have those key skills to respond effectively and ensure that we have a coordinated approach. This, we think, is perhaps key in terms of ensuring that we have an added value for, for, for WPAs. I was, employed, I was deployed in uh, UNMIS for about five and a half uh, months last year, just returned in January 2013. And my main mission was to set up the women protection advisors in the United Nations mission in South Sudan, so UNMIS. This was actually the first time that the United Nations was setting up women protection advisors um, in accordance with uh, the Security Council resolutions 1888 and 1960, which basically mandated the setup of women protection advisors to respond to growing concerns about conflict-related sexual <laughs> violence and to respond to also to re respond to how to, to strengthen how we were actually as a UN dealing with this issue on the ground. Uh, my task there uh, really involved from the very ground negotiating the structure, what it actually meant to, impl to implement or operationalize this Security Council resolution. We have the resolution. There are some ideas that we have in mind. Here in New York, when we sat down and we put together the terms of reference for the, for the WPAs and how they should actually work, we had another set of ideas, which actually came together quite nicely. But when you get to the ground, it's something else. So you have the mission leadership with a view and, and, and other partners on the ground with a view as to how they think it should, what they think it should look like. And obviously, they have the context, and rightly so, they can also add a lot to how we want this thing to work on the ground. So my role really was to try to see how we could negotiate a, a, a process in South Sudan that would meet the Security Council standards, um, conform with the terms of reference um, set up by the, the lead agencies on this issue, which are w, um, DPKO, um, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, <clears throat> um, Political Affairs, and the Office of the SRSG Sexual Violence. And so, so we wanted to, and of course, to have that, that, uh, that uh, country-specific response. So the, my priority in arriving there, when I, when I got there, there was a mission, the mission's view was that we should have one unit that looks at this, separate and apart from everything else. So the first step was how do we, so to speak, dismantle this unit and ensure that we put these WPAs in the correct places where they can actually be more effective, where they can actually respond to um, conflict-related sexual violence more effectively, and where they can actually build on existing UN resources. One of the things that the Security Council resolution said is that these WPAs should be placed in gender and human rights components, recognizing that these components already do a lot of this work. So what we wanted to do is to say, how do we build on what we already have, rather than starting up a separate unit and something entirely different. So we know that conflict-related sexual violence is a human rights violation, and so our human rights officers on the ground are following it. The question for us then as human rights, as, as, w, as WPAs, is to what extent can they give it that dedicated focus? How can they drill down into the subject matter if they're covering 10 other violations? Given the, the, the relevance of this issue, the importance of the issue um, here and internationally, um, and, and recognizing that this issue is a peace and security issue, we need to have that expertise drill down, to, to, to drill down into this subject matter. And that is what, what, what we sought to do. The same thing with the gender unit, where they're actually doing a lot of capacity building in terms of um, um, strengthening uh, responses to women, uh, particularly with respect to SGBB, but also understanding how that differs 
from what we do in terms of conflict-related sexual violence, and so that we look specifically at violations that relate to conflict, not domestic violence or the other issues that come in the broader context of violence, but how do we pull that out <clears throat> from the other issues that the gender unit is looking at the, and, and, uh, and sort of give this sexual violence a particular focus. So that we train, we build capacity, we mainstream, and we ensure that as a UN system on the ground, we can actually have an effective response. So the idea there, as I said, was to gain, to have that, that dedicated response and to have them placed in various areas of the mission to build on what we already have. Somebody mentioned earlier when we had a brief discussion that about resources and being creative. I think that the main thing about that is using what we have and building on what we have instead of recreating um, new new processes, structures, and, and, and mechanisms. So when 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 um, what we did in South Sudan is to set up the WPAs in three basic three three elements of the mission. So we have a senior coordinator that sits in the office of the the SRSG the special representative of the Secretary General. And that senior basically is coordinating the work within the mission and ensuring that we have the relevant parts coming together on this issue. So the role is advisory. She is the chief advisor for the, for the um, SRSG on these issues. The role is coordination. The role is also political in terms of um, advocacy and understanding, sh sharing, making sure that we, we bring this issue to the light that it needs to be in, in terms of um, understanding it in, in, in South Sudan. And um, so that, that was one area. The senior is placed there. Then we had um, the WPAs in gender. And those WPAs would be working specifically to build capacity within the mission. There is, I mean, of course we can say that the state has a challenge sometimes in understanding issues, these issues. But if we are to be honest, some of our colleagues have a challenge in understanding these issues and what we actually mean when we say conflict-related sexual violence. So the key role of our gender colleagues, our WPAs in gender, was to really break this issue down and to, and to let our colleagues first and foremost understand it, and also to build capacity within the state, within the national institutions, um, for, so that they understand what it is they're responding to. First of all, how they, how they identify it, what are we talking about, and, and, and then how do we respond. The, the third set of WPAs were per, placed in human rights. And those WPAs are essentially doing human rights work. They are human rights officers. So they're investigating, they're monitoring, they're analyzing, and they're reporting on violations of this human rights violation called conflict-related sexual violence. And this whole group comes together with the wider mission in terms of its response. I'm talking about child protection. They're also, of, as we know, sexual violence also impacts children. And so we're working quite closely with child protection. We're working very closely with the police. We're working very closely with protection of civilians. And we have set up, within the context of rolling out the MARA, the Monitoring Analysis and Reporting Arrangements, we've set up a working group on conflict-related sexual violence. And all the relevant components of the mission come together within that working group to share ideas, ensure that we have common um, um, processes, ensure that we're not duplicating efforts, ensure that we share that information in the best way possible um, for an effective coordinated UN response. I should add that also in that working group, we have the UN country team. And often people will say, how do you work with UN women? How do they fit into this? Or how do you work with UNFPA? All of these colleagues are doing excellent work on sexual violence and on, on, on SGBV. So the working group gives us a chance really to come together to look specifically at conflict-related sexual violence. And those of you who, who may understand a little bit more about how we operate in the field, there is, of course, a, a SGBV, a sexual and gender-based violence, um, subcluster operating already. So the idea is not to duplicate that, but really to have something that, again, focuses specifically on sexual violence. And I keep coming back to this issue of, about the specificity of this particular issue if we want to, to move it forward in terms of, of a coordinated response. So that's how we are rolled out, basically, in South Sudan. And I'm going to skip through to, um, let's, to, to just briefly, I know my time is running out, but just to briefly say 
what do we mean by conflict-related sexual, sexual violence in South Sudan? Because it means different things in different settings, to be honest. Um, so for us, we've looked at um, what human rights is doing, what gender is doing, child protection, rule of law, civil affairs, and the SGBV, SGBV subcluster. And we said to them, what, how, do you, how do you look at this issue? And we look at what the international definition of, of, of um, sexual violence is. And we, we came up with sort of issues that we would consider conflict-related um, sexual violence. So our definitions in South Sudan include rape, sexual slavery, torture, and inhumane treatment. That, that includes um, all forms of um, sexual violence that relate to a conflict. So we're talking about forced abortion, forced sterilization, abduction, threats to physical and mental integrity, and harmful traditional practices that take place within the context of um, the conflict. And this happens in South Sudan in several different arenas. It's in a very interesting country, because you have a conflict between South Sudan and Sudan. So that's one area that we're looking at. Then within South Sudan, there's intercommunal violence. And many of you may have heard about incidents in Jiangle, also in Wau County, where there have been violence between tribal groups, essentially. And um, that violence takes a very specific form, because it often directly relates to um, conflict-related sexual violence. And I'll get to that in a minute. And um, there's also, we're looking at sexual violence that take place in the context of the disarmament process. And in South Sudan, we have this disarmament process that's going on, where we, it's led by the military. Normally, we would have the police um, it playing a key role in disarmament. But the military is leading this. And there have been a number of incidents of rape um, that have taken place um, allegedly by the SPLA, the South, um, the South Sudan um, military um, service. Um, and so we're looking also very closely at, at how that plays out in terms of sexual violence in the disarmament process. We also have um, concerns about sexual violence in cross border, involving cross border groups. So we have the, the Lord's Resistance Army moving back and forth across the border um, in Uganda and in, 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 that, in that region of the country. And of course, we have it also in terms of when we look at IDBs and refugee camps. And that's sometimes a bit challenging for us to actually assess. Um, and, and we rely quite heavily on our colleagues um, from UNHCR who are doing a lot of work in this area. And, um, and of course, the final area that we're looking at is um, the, those incidents that take place in terms of local militias and rebel armed groups. And um, we had an uh, incident in, in December when I was in South Sudan where we had um, unrest in, in, in Wau County and we had some 4,000 women and children coming to the gates of the UN basically seeking refuge. And so, you know, the, the, the conflict there we needed to understand to the extent to which that actually there was any conflict-related sexual violence. But that's the type of sort of rebel arm groups, militia conflict that we're trying to, to, to also ensure that we, we keep in the scope when we explore for conflict-related sexual violence. Now, I talked earlier about this issue of, um, and I'm going to really stick a point on this, on the issue of abductions, and because it, it, it's a good example um, when you want to understand how conflict-related sexual violence plays out in an area where there may not be an international conflict. And rather, there's a conflict between tribes, so to speak. So what you have is one tribe going to another and not in cattle raids. The intention is to raid cattle. But in raiding cattle, they also may take a number of children and a number of women. And the question is, what happens to these women and children? And I'm going to focus primarily on the women, because as a women protection advisor, that's, that's basically what I'm doing. Our child protection officers, working closely with them, they're looking at what's happening with the children in terms of abductions. But many of these women are forced into marriage, are forced, forced into sexual slavery. And these are the types of concerns that we have. So when we look at our incidents of, 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 um, of, of intercommunal violence, and we, we try to take into our early warning indicators, what does that mean when we talk about 
cattle raiding? How do we actually ensure that our indicators on, co on conflict-related sexual violence fit in there so that we pick up that when they go to raid cattle, they also abduct women. And when they abduct women, they're also taking women as sex slaves and what that actually means. So this is kind of how we see the, the conflict-related sexual violence. I'm going to wrap up, because I know my five minutes is coming very close to 10, just to say that, you know, <laughs> probably, I've probably gone over. I'm getting some, some, some. <laughs> but um, just to say quickly that, um, um, you know, this has been an excellent experience in, 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 in South Sudan. There's no, when you go there and you try to, to do this you, and, and, you, and you work on this, this particular issue, you see the whole UN system coming together as one. You see that you get to see, as I'm here in, in New York, how this resolution came about in the Security Council. You get to see how we, within the, the UN family, sat down and operationalized that, kind of put that in the policy frame. And then you get to go to South Sudan and you try to implement that. And within implementing that, you work within, the, within the, the, the mission, you bring in the country teams, you actually work with the government, you, you, you liaise quite closely with civil society organizations, and you see how we as a UN come together as a UN family and how this, I think, is intended to work. I think it's a good, it's a good um, um, case. And, and I know that we can't say that you know, one size will fit all, but I think this is a good uh, example of how we can effectively roll out WPAs at, within, within a, a particular country. And if we can actually consider, I, I think we ought to be considering how we can replicate this particular rollout in other UN missions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Ginell. I, I was uh, sitting here thinking that we had discussed downstairs that one of the purposes tonight is to differentiate the, the roles. And uh, so I was going to try and be the, the time clock person and all that. But I thought, well, this is uh, definitely worth uh, listening to. Um, and I, I really appreciate that. And I look forward to the discussion, because I already have some questions uh, that I'd like to ask. Um, our second uh, panelist tonight is Ms. Elsie Afang Mbella. Ms. Afang Mbella has more than 30 years of experience in bilateral and multilateral diplomacy, including 17 years dedicated to the promotion of gender equality and empowerment. As senior gender advisor for MINUSCO, she has promoted firsthand programs and mechanisms designed to enhance the psychosocio so, social rehabilitation of vulnerable civilians, especially women and girls in conflict and post-conflict situations. She is a career diplomat, and she started her career in the Cameroon Diplomatic Corps. So uh, Elsie, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Maureen. And, um, I appreciate your flexibility with timing <laughs> um, because um, when we spoke earlier, you wanted to know a wide range of issues about how uh, Resolution 1325 is being rolled out in the Congo, um, what, with what impact, and uh, what are the challenges, and what is the way forward. And so I, I, I suppose that uh, many of you here know about the context in the Congo, uh, because our work um, derives from that context. Uh, sustained armed conflict uh, for close to two decades now, especially in the east of Congo, recurrent rapes, and um, a high ratio of displaced persons. Um, and the figure changes, you know, uh, but the, what is certain that is above 500,000 IDPs. And uh, just for this uh, year alone, 2012, after the fall of Goma, that figure has increased tremendously um, in the eastern part of the Congo. Uh, women and girls uh, are used as weapons of war, and uh, there is a high level of, of trafficking, sexual slavery, 
we did um, an investigation ourselves through a study of what happens in women in the mining areas of Congo in seven provinces. And uh, there was every indication of very unprotected and unhealthy circumstances under which uh, these women and girls work. And yet women and girls are very important in terms of completing the chain of small-scale exploitation of mineral resources in the Congo, which is one of their mainstay or their means of survival. And so um, women uh, are facing, uh, w when 1325 was passed, it was passed as a hopeful resol resolution that projected women as agents who would be engaged in bringing about change. But uh, the conflict uh, has made it in such a way that we're now talking mostly about women as victims, forgetting about their dynamism and about the, the important role that they play and that they could play in bringing about global peace and security. And the work of the gender advisor is to bring them back to that level of being agents of change. And through so many ways, through security sector development, through protection of these women, both mentally and, and physically, and making sure that they are an active part of all decision-making processes uh, with regard to peace building, making sure that uh, we as gender advisors support the administration you know, to include women in the peace building agenda of the mission, but also making sure that these women are empowered to become a forceful and, comp and engaged part of the, the national reconstruction process, which peace building is all about. So this is the work of the gender advisor, and it is broad because you have to mainstream it through every single priority of the mission in terms of uh, protection of civilians, in terms of security sector development, in terms of the disarmament and, and demobilization and uh, repatriation of ex-combatants, uh, in terms of the uh, stabilization and peace consolidation process. And so this is a very big mandate. We have tasks which are uh, uh, crucial, crucial, critical, and the critical tasks are to reduce all forms of conflict, to reduce all forms of sexual and gender-based violence, and I have told you about the participation of women and including them in all decision making, enhancing their safety, and meeting their specific needs, especially in situations of conflict and post-conflict. These are the critical tasks that a gender advisor is supposed to promote, you know, and to support technically uh, in all ways. How have we been able to do this work? In the Congo, we've managed to do it through the building of partnerships for policy advocacy. And we have contributed in making sure that the Ministry of Gender has a national action plan on 1325. And we have provided the impetus you know, for creating the mechanisms for coordinating that national action plan. We've worked with the UN country team in this regard, civil society partners. We've also worked with the Ministry of Gender very closely on this. We're supporting the development also of the national strategy for combating sexual and gender-based violence. She talked about it, Corey, and this is actively supported by the mission and by the UN country team with line ministries. And you know that there are five pillars for supporting this implementation of the national action plan in terms of um, Prevention and protection is, is uh, the Ministry of, 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 um, of, uh, of Health and also the Ministry of uh, the, the UNHCR. In terms of multisectoral um, development, it is, um, it is the uh, Ministry of Health and uh, UNICEF. And then in terms of data and mapping, it is the Ministry of Gender and UNFPA. And uh, in terms of combating impunity, it is the Minister for Justice and in, 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 in partnership also with, um, with uh, the human rights uh, component of MONUSCO. 
And also, um, uh, in terms of security sector development, it is the Minister of Defense and um, the SSR uh, component of MONUSCO. And MONUSCO plays the overall role of coordination. We are the only mission that has a, a, a section dedicated to sexual, uh, uh, sexual violence in conflict. And so um, this is one area where we have dedicated our, our resources, both financially and, and, and uh, in human terms. Uh, we're networking also with uh, the MONUSCO um, because to the, the, the entry point for us in terms of protection is to have national laws that protect the rights of women, you know, and which could be implemented and followed through. And so we do not have this yet in the Congo. And so the, 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 gender, the, the gender section in collaboration with the gender ministry and the political affairs division of MONUSCO have spearheaded advocacy in parliament for the putting establishment of a commission on gender parity, which is going to be a permanent commission to comb through all the laws of the country to make sure that it takes into consideration the issue of gender parity and the access of women to, um, to, to, to a, 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 a national development and to their rights. Because without this protection is very difficult. Also, we have worked with, and I want to thank the government of Luxembourg that gave us this opportunity uh, to work with women in the region, you know, to, um, on preventive diplomacy, especially combating electoral violence. And we were able to get the women to have a declaration on that, you know, just so that um, um, it, we can follow through the recommendations of the Security Council in terms of women's secure participation in elections. What else has worked is liaison uh, with uh, the, uh, um, the, the STAREC, which is the Stabilization Committee uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the government of the DRC, and which is supposed to implement, you have heard about the 2009 agreement which is now in limbo because of the rebellion of M23. But STAREC is supposed to implement that agreement, and we have worked with the members of STAREC, you know, uh, supporting them to build their capacity in, on gender issues, and also to be able to uh, then uh, uh, be more productive in terms of p conflict um, resolution and conflict prevention. And we have trained 219 of their members on this issue. And we have mobilized networks in the DRC to be in touch with STAREC, you know, for security intelligence, for communication. And we have a communi community, uh, I, I, they call it CANS, community alert networks, having the population itself be engaged in protection issues for their own protection, but with the local authorities. You had heard about what happened in Walikale in 2010. The gender office was in the forefront in investigating the mass rapes that happened there and in providing the impetus for a MONUSCO company base to be put in Walikale. And from there originated the idea of community liaison assistance. This community liaison assistance keep in touch with the community, the local authorities, the women's networks, the men's networks, and make sure that they are in touch with the MONUSCO uh, company basis for the better protection of women and girls, especially in volatile areas. And so um, we, in, um, besides this, we have also used our capacity in terms of logistics to be able to secure a military uh, escort for victims who are in enclaved places. We have also supported so many mobile legal clinics that are, 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 are put in place by MONUSCO uh, so that 
we can bring justice closer to the victims. Because you know that um, this country where we work from is very broad in scope, and it is very difficult. Most of the victims are in totally enclaved areas. Without the logistics of MONUSCO and the support, facilitation support of the gender office, it is very difficult to reach these victims. And so we have used that to be able to get them to access medical, um, medical support and also carry the very wounded cases through MONUSCO logistics again and our facilitation to hospitals. And uh, so uh, uh, the scope is broad, but we have also facilitated uh, for, the for the military to have more patrols where uh, there are dangers for women, like in water points, you know, um, like in the markets, like in far removed uh, junctions. MONUSCO has quick impact projects and for these purposes, and all of them, we ensure that they are undertaken with the needs of women in mind. And uh, this is one facility, but we also have the challenges, as you know, and the challenges I have referred to some, the scope, also the issue of using our comparative advantages, you know, to our profit, because the, the, the constant uh, 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 resolutions from the, from the from the, from, the, from the Security Council sometimes undermine this comparative advantage, which we, um, my colleague Corey has referred to so rightly, and which we need to use to reinforce each other, you know, rather than trying to, because there is no one agency, you know, no matter how well financed, who can face the challenges in the field all by themselves. There is not one. Even with the logistical capacity of MONUSCO, we are not able, we have a broad representation, but we are not able to be everywhere. The gender office operates only from six out of 11 provinces. And so you can imagine what happens to other agencies that operate only in two of those provinces, or sometimes even only in one province. And so the issue of complementarity is very important in, for us to be able to do our work. We have also been able to use the, the, the massive uh, and robust um, information capacity of MONUSCO to be able to disseminate, um, to, the, to be able to disseminate information quickly. Uh, and the, the issue that we face, which is the, the last, and I, mo I would end there, is that we do not have enough resources to implement the very broad mandate that has been given to us. Most of the money goes for fighting sexual violence in conflict, but all the other gender issues are overlooked, and she's raised them very well. The issue of forced marriages, the issue of lack of access to land for women, which impedes their possibility to contribute to the peace process. All of those issues, there is no funding for them in the rest of the country, and yet, the, the, the problems of women are so pervasive. And to end it all, I would like to, to, to signify that women in the Congo constitute 52% of the population, and they are 60% of the workforce. And if we are not going to support them to come to the limelight, to be actively engaged in the peace process, then there's always going to be recurrent instability in the Congo, no matter how much we spend money in other things. I thank you. Uh, th thank you, Elsie. I especially liked uh, your point of uh, saying that there is the, the aspects of the work where you focus on the women as the victim, but that you also focus as well as on the women as participants in the process of peace building and peacekeeping. I look forward to coming back to that those points a little bit more in our discussion. Uh, so now I turn to um, our next panelist. We're pleased uh, to have, uh, it's a pleasure to have Mr. Lucien Leclerc. Mr. Leclerc has been a member of the Royal Canadian Mountain, Mountain Police for over 25 years. He is a sergeant with the Narcotic Division. And so I asked him just a few minutes ago, so now how did you end up in Haiti? Um, so in 2012, he told me, well, he told me a little more, I'll tell you in a second. He, in 2012, he joined the, the UN mission in Haiti, MINUSTA, and he's working on a, on a project, a special project focused on sexual and gender-based violence issues. 
But he told me that he, his previous experience with the UN, he had worked in the UN system in Cote d'Ivoire. And actually, in Cote d'Ivoire, in that mission, he was doing the investigation of these kind of cases. So that's how the, uh, this, uh, and he's still in the narcotic division, uh, got to Haiti. So uh, Lucien, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good evening. In AD, the minister, HGBV, Norwegian Special Project, has been involved since October 2010. Six months after the inauguration, the Norwegian assessment report, based on UN police gender focal point on the field across the country, identified that the SGBV investigation is a major and serious problem. Two main problems stood out. Numerous SGBV, SGBV victims do not report sexual aggressions. They are frightened of being labeled and judged by the population. So we ask why? Due to the lack of HNP, which is the 80 national police uh, offices, most of the time the victims have to provide their statement directly at the front desk of the commissariat without privacy. Also, it has been noted in different surveys, in the Norwegian assessments also, that numerous HNP do not see sexual aggression as an important crime and are not sensitized of the seriousness of the crime. Some of them even condescend the, the crime. Now, before explaining our two goals of the Norwegian project, I would just like to give two little stats. In 2012, in Haiti, 650 rapes have been reported. Among them, 417 were minors. That's a ratio of 1.7 rape a day. This year, 2013, as of yesterday, 170 rapes have been reported and 134 were minors, which is a ratio of 1.1 rape a day. Now, with all that information, what we did, the team, the Norwegian project, in accordance with the AET development plan, we identified two main strategic goals. One, professionalize the HNP regarding investigation on SGBV. Two, reinforce the HNP operational capacities. Now for the first goal, we had two objectives. I repeat the goal is to professionalize the HNP regarding SGBV investigation. The first goal, with, in accordance with the police academy and the school director, was to find and train candidates that would be willing to become SGBV instructors. 36 candidates was chosen, and in, in September 2011, those 36 HNPs have been formed and trained, attended, in a 10 days extensive course by the Norwegian. With those instructors, our goal since October 2012 is to train 1,000 HNP across the country. As of today, 710 has been trained, among them 125 women. We believe we're gonna achieve through our goal which is 1,000 by October 2013. Now our second goal, second goal, reinforcing the HNP operational capacities. The main objective of that goal is to provide better facilities for gender victims. The, the team goal is to provide space and furnish offices, proper offices for the victims. The offices will ensure 
privacy and security for the victims. The team has as an objective to renovate or build two offices in the nine departments in, in IT. If there's no space available in the commissariat or the police station, we have the funds to build two offices. So far, as of today, five offices, five offices have been uh, renewed and two have been constructed for a total of seven. Our goal is to construct 10 to 12 by October 2013. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Lucienne. We appreciate the, 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 the diversity of our, our panel here. What, what we had wanted to do tonight was we, we have the, the voices from the field, the expertise, um, so that uh, an opportunity to discuss you know, the, the different kinds of work that is going on uh, by the, in the peacekeeping missions related to uh, women and uh, uh, the, the gender perspectives. And so anyhow, in addition, we invited uh, Major General Prakit Khmer to be on the panel as our discussant, also as someone to give the, the overall view and perspective, and he told me early he's gonna be a little bit uh, provocative. But let me introduce him, Major General Patrick Khmer. Uh, General Khmer had a uh, distinguished military career in both the Royal Netherlands Marine Corps and the United Nations. Uh, his UN experience included work in Cambodia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Ethiopia and Eritrea, and the Democrat Democratic Republic of Congo. Since his retirement from the military in 2007, he has been an advocate with regard to issues, um, a range of issues such as international peace <clears throat> and security, peace support operations, peacekeeping, security sector reform, and others. So, General, the, the, the floor is yours, and we appreciate your being here. Ambassador Quinn, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure that um, I have the opportunity to say a few words tonight um, after the three speakers from the field who informed us of a number of things that have been achieved in, in relation to gender Security Council Resolution 3025, 1820. And they have mentioned a number of outstanding challenges. Let me mention in the five minutes allocated to me a few aspects, a few observations in relation to the subject from a security angle. You cannot, you must forgive me that that I do that from a security point of view. Um, everybody agrees that Resolution 3025 was a milestone and has put women, peace and security and the gender aspects firmly on the map. First at the strategic level here in New York and then more and more in the field. And yes, a lot has been achieved thanks also to the effort of our colleagues who just spoke. But let me frank with you, I think that a lot more has to be done before we really can say that we are successful, depending on the criteria how you define success. Let me mention three observations, and I will include the hot issue of the protection of civilians. First observation is activities and coordination at strategic and operational tactical level. In the last decade, at the strategic level, many mechanisms have been established at the various offices of DPKO, at UN Women, Office of the SRG for Sexual Violence, Office of the SRG for Children in Armed Conflict, etc. I have observed that there is many times, unfortunately, an overlap, doublures in activities, 
turf battles, responsibilities, not always easy to coordinate. Sometimes there is a lack of coordination and a culture of endless meetings and discussions resulting in a slow process to get things done. Demands to the field for reporting to so many related actors at the strategic level is high. Dissemination of information should be coordinated here in New York and should not be the headache of those people in the field. Now, you might have seen the latest study on the protection of civilians coordinating mechanisms in UN peacekeeping as the follow-up on the DPKO OCHA study of a few years back. It's a very good study. It gives a good overview of all sorts of innovative measures and coordinating measures in the various missions. And Elsie and Gael have already spoken about that. However, I sometimes get the feeling that those innovative ideas are quickly smothered in lengthy procedures and coordinating mechanisms. Sometimes it looks as if coordination is an objective in itself. And I'm very interested in all sorts of meetings, but I'm more interested in the results of all those meetings because only the results count. Not the amount of meetings, the results count. And I've observed and experienced this at the headquarters level, I and mean, I've been military advisor here a few years back, so I have a little bit of an idea about that, but I also observed that during my visits to the field, where, for example, the joint protection teams in MONUSCO are bogged down in endless procedures to try desperately to get consensus between all those actors with the result that they only deploy a very limited amount of times. What I miss is decisive leadership to overcome and overrule all sorts of bureaucratic processes and rules to make things happen fast and to be able to deploy ad hoc with joint teams of civilian, military, and police colleagues. Because endless coordinating, and I have been sitting not that long ago in one of those meetings in Bukavu and in Goma, endless coordination leads to inflexibility and a loss of quick decision making. And in my view, I'm retired, so whatever. In my view, the lead vision, the slogan, should be get things done. Because the victims are not waiting for the outcome of your endless meetings, where you try to get everybody and their dog on board. All right? Second point is the protection of civilians, including sexual gender-based violence. The umbrella of protection of civilians under which conflict-related sexual violence and the prevention of violence is sheltering is at the moment, unfortunately, not a very tight waterproof umbrella. DPKO, troop contributors, Security Council are confused what a mission could, should, and ought to do using force to protect the most vulnerable of the local population. There is no political consensus on what does robust peacekeeping mean for the use of force, for the posture of civilian, military, and police colleagues. Now, if the strategic headquarters is confused, what do you expect in the field? Despite all the coordinating mechanisms and a strong protection of civilian coordinating architecture, as is the case in MONUSCO, and how it is described in this good study that I just mentioned, the mission failed 
over the years to stop or prevent the atrocities against the local population, in particular against women and children, in Minova, in Kivanju, you name them, culminating in the drama in Goma in November last year. The third and last observation is the preparation of civilian, military, and police who will be deployed to a mission. Is that preparation sufficient? Do all those people understand Security Council Resolution 1325 and 1820? Do they really know how to deal with civilian colleagues, female, police? Do the military understand? Are they prepared for that in their pre-deployment training? My experience over the last four years, traveling around, lecturing, explaining, assessing, discussing with NGOs, UN civilian and military and police authorities, observing with my own eyes, that there is a significant gap in knowledge and understanding what is required on the issue of gender on women, peace and security, and sexual gender-based violence. There is in many pre-deployment trainings hardly any change since the time of traditional peacekeeping. There is no mentioning of those subjects. And there are still very few female military officers involved in reaching out to the female part of the local police. I give you very quickly three recommendations. First, to focus on the preparation to, for the UN deployment for the military and police during their pre-deployment training, so that 1325 and 1820 are involved. Recruit female specialized military and police and increase the civilian military relations. Second is let's streamline the efforts of so many actors on the subject here in headquarters and in the field so that the UN is more effective and efficient in its actions and that get things done in a flexible and even ad hoc way when it is needed. And finally, DPKO should take the lead in finding out what really is the problem why a number of troop contributing countries are so reluctant to use force to protect civilians from violence and reaching political consensus with the council and the troop contributors what robust peacekeeping means. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much, General, and um, I appreciate how you brought things uh, all together with a, a bigger perspective on peacekeeping in general. So I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I will open up the floor to give all of you uh, a chance. And I just, um, I'm going to start uh, actually with you, Ganel, because I want to go back to what you talked about. Uh, you talked, you, had, you, you focused a lot on what you did internally in the mission when you were in South Sudan. And you mentioned one incident uh, regarding uh, sexual violence in dis disarmament. Um, um, and with the local police. And I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit about in your time there of working with your local partners um, and explaining to them what's this women protector advisor role um, and if, if possible in relationship to uh, sexual vi violence in disarmament. Thank you. Actually, I will, will start by saying that most of my work did indeed focus on setting up within the mission. This is a brand new uh, mechanism, so it's never been done before. It's important that we get it right in the mission. A part of that, I agree, must involve the way we interact with our local partners and what we take from them. So when I landed in South Sudan, one of the things I did was to have a whole series of meetings with, with the government to see where they were at, what they were doing, what their understanding is, and that involved going to meet with prosecutors, going to meet with um, um, uh, women, in, going to see women in prison to understand a little bit what was happening with them, um, going to meet with with um, the relevant government agencies, the, particularly the Ministry of Gender, 
and to understand a little bit about their plan of action that they were putting in place, how, to what extent it actually incorporated some of the sexual violence uh, agenda, specifically sexual violence agenda, and whether there was a, a sufficiently um, well understood um, um, aspect on conflict-related sexual violence. From my view, there is not a very good understanding of what we mean by conflict-related sexual violence. And as I mentioned in my, in my uh, present presentation, I think we within the UN are still trying to understand what we mean by that and, and, and trying to break that down for the government is sometimes challenging. And, and um, because there is a lot of reluctance to even speak about the issue of rape, sexual violence, it's, it's really difficult to get them to speak about this issue. Um, traditionally, it's not something that they would speak about. So I also had extensive meetings with um, the, the Human Rights uh, Commission there to understand what kind of work they were doing, whether they were actually looking at these issues. And again, the answer is really not really. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. That is, what, that is what it said to me. Since I was in the process of setting up, I was in, also in the process of gathering information and assessing where we're at um, so that we would know where we need to place our resources. Um, we have um, five human rights officers deployed to the field, and we have 10 states. So we were trying to see where would it be best to place these people. And to get that understanding, we needed to get that also from the government players and, of course, from the NGOs. The NGOs are doing really good work on SGBV. Um, they're doing a lot of good work on women's access to justice. Um, they're doing work on referrals for, for victims of, of rape um, to a certain extent, along with UNFPA. But to actually do the kind of work that we're hoping to do, that we've started doing since we've put WPAs in, um, um, on the ground in, in, in UNMIS, that was really lacking. And, um, and again, I think it's not, it's not because of, uh, I would say it's, it, it's not a, a lack of will, really. It's, it's a lack of understanding of what we really mean. And so that's the first step that I, I saw. So, so there was a, that effort really to engage local partners, primarily the government and the, and the, and the NGOs. And, um, but, but to really say that that's a step that we need to go once we have it right within the UN. Uh, thank you. So my next question is for you, Elsie, because um, you, again, talking in about women as active uh, participants, and we, you talked about peace building a little bit, but down, when we were downstairs before we came up, you talked as well about um, your, your role uh, in relationship to the, the new mission of Mary Robinson and your work with women as uh, promoting women as peace builders. Could you just talk about that for a few minutes? Thank you. I think that's an important part of um, our vision for the future uh, because um, the work of um, Special Envoy Mary Robinson is um, linked to the implementation of Resolution 2098, uh, which is the new mandate of MONUSCO. And um, she has um, um, a, one of her strongest priorities is to ensure that women are involved in the implementation of uh, the peace, security, and cooperation framework for the DRC and for the region. And so we already had um, a first working session with her, where she explained her mandate to the civil society and where the civil society also um, explained to her what were their priorities in terms of the implementation of the peace and security framework. And uh, the gender office in MONUSCO helped to prepare the women of the civil society for that meeting. And in bringing out uh, the crucial issues that they had to raise with uh, Mary Robinson in terms of the return of refugees, which she also raised with the Security Council here, because you know that um, the DRC has been bogged down since 1994, when they opened a corridor after the Rwanda genocide, that there are so many Rwandese that uh, came into the DRC and who have not left. Some of them have become permanent uh, residents there in Rwanda. Others have joined armed groups. And so the issue of refugees, people being able to go back 
to where they came from <laughs> is a crucial part of an effective implementation of the, of the peace framework. Another issue which the women raised and which is pertinent to our work is that they be involved not only in the implementation but also in the evaluation of the agreement and the way forward, making sure that there is a local mechanism in which they are implicated and also a regional mechanism in which they are implicated in such a way that you know they are all working towards the same goal in the region of consolidating the peace, uh, not only in the DRC but in the Great Lakes region. And uh, uh, Mary Robinson has agreed that you know um, uh, President Museveni will call a meeting um, in Ju July, you know, to build a regional, you know, a regional framework, uh, 1325 uh, regional action plan, uh, which is going to be uh, focused on the implementation of the peace agreement. And so we are also engaged in preparing the women for that. We have a first meeting um, you know, on the 6th uh, of, of, of June, you know, to, to, to really spell out to them because uh, our role is to make sure that they really understand every inch of the peace agreement and the mechanisms which have been put up. We also have a role to play in terms of making sure that women are included in the uh, in the in the mechanism that would take over from the force uh, intervention brigade, uh, there is a plan to um, to train um, military, the police, the judiciary, you know, um, so that this f in, uh, uh, brigade is not going to be in the DRC for a very long time. We want to make sure that women are involved in that specialized training, you know, at every level, and that there is there are, there are laws that allow them, you know, to access these mechanisms. Because without those laws, you know, it will be very difficult uh, 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 to enforce anything. And so uh, the issue of legal safeguards for their participation is very important to us, and we uh, would like to work with uh, Madam Robinson on those issues of how to make sure that the legal framework is there for the women to be able to access these mechanisms effectively. And also, um, there is the issue, or as uh, the general has raised, of making sure that um, women are in the first intervention brigade itself. Uh, in the, the military capacity and who understand gender issues. He raised the issue of people not knowing um, the military not being at par in terms of what 1325 is all about. And I think that he, he raised that correctly. But we've also taken steps, you know, to make sure that we are more proactive in terms of going to them before they are deployed. We've done this in Tanzania, and we're going to do it again in Malawi. This is all part of the, uh, of the uh, peace framework, uh, so that they come understanding you know what 1325 is all about. We have developed in DPKO a military guideline, you know, for integrating gender issues in the work of the military, and we're making it available now to them even before they come, you know, so that uh, they, we have check checklists for every possible scenario in the field. And it's something that we did with the military in the DPKO. It was very intensive work with the contribution of all uh, uh, of the DPKO missions. And so this work uh, uh, cannot be undermined. I think we've learned from our mistakes in the past, and we've taken steps uh, to correct them. Well, thank you. So. Um, I, I might have one or two questions for you all later, but I, I really do want to open up uh, the, the, to, our, to our, our audience here for questions um, and give them a chance to participate in the discussion as well. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, uh, some questions over this side. We'll take the two questions over here. I ask you all to say who you are, and uh, we are webcasting. We always remind people to hold the mic uh, steady. And um, then we'll turn it over to our panelists. 
Thank you very much. My name is Susanne Friesgeier. I'm from the German Mission. And thanks to all the panelists and as well to, for, to IPI to organize this very interesting meeting. And I think it's very timely. And I'm especially glad that you will have the opportunity to brief the Security Council tomorrow. Because as Mr. Kamert pointed out, I guess there is still a little bit confusion about what exactly the gender advisors and the women protection advisors do and what is the difference. And um, it is a little bit astonishing that that you can see that the Security Council already asked in 2009 to deploy women protection advisors. And so far, as far as I know, there are only women protection advisors deployed in South Sudan. So it was very interesting to hear your experience, Mrs. Curry, about um, how and then you best set up. And I, I heard most of the arguments why there are still no women protection advisors is the lack of resources and of personnel. And of course, you pointed out the best case scenario, that you have women protection advisors in the um, SRSG's office and in um, human rights and gender. So I assume that given the lack of resources and personnel, which will continue, um, maybe some of the missions will only get one or two women protection advisors. So my question would be, where do you think, from your experience, would be the best place to place them? Um, and um, would, what would be the best argument to counter um, those who say, in fact, we don't need a women protection advisor. Maybe it can be done by the um, human rights department or POC section or whichever else to just um, sort of save a little bit of personnel. Thank you. So we'll take the, uh, the other question on this side of the room. Thank you. My name is Mavi Cabrera Baleza from the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. And I add my thanks to IPI uh, and uh, to our panelists for the enlightening uh, presentations. Um, yeah, and, and this question is uh, focused on the DRC, and it's great to see Elsie here. We were in DRC in April to organize the Women's Peace Delegation and Women's Peace Dialogue. And what we, what reaffirmed our observation in the DRC is that there is really no shortage of policies, interventions, and mechanisms that address sexual violence in the DRC. Um, back in April, we counted that there are already 31 Security Council resolutions focused on the DRC. And um, we have one coming up uh, in June. Well, it's not focused on the DRC, but on sexual violence why, uh, broadly. But, uh, and then um, there was also a communique between the special representative of the Secretary General on sexual violence in conflict. And of course, there is the peace and security cooperation framework that Elsie just uh, explained to us. Uh, in light of all of this, um, we have um, some high-level officials of the DRC, uh, and we've had dialogues with them, ministers of justice and ministers of gender. Um, we asked them, at the time we were there, uh, there was another mass rape in, prov in Province Oriental. Over 200 women were raped. It was at the time when uh, SRSG Bangura was there and uh, Minister Haig of the UK was there. And it happened ar around the same time. So we asked them about this situation and, and also going back to the Walikale incident, how, you know, have there been arrests, have there, have there been prosecution? And our uh, assumption was confirmed that there weren't. So uh, basically, um, they told us that the government of the DRC is not in control of some areas in the country. So it's, it's practically an admission of you know, lack of control and powerlessness over the situation. So what do you do? What do we do with all of these resolutions and the coming up resolutions? Uh, in light of this admission by the government of their lack of capacity and powerlessness to protect their own people? And, and how does that impact uh, on your work in MONUSCO? 
uh, and, and also bringing again in the context all of these international resolutions and mechanisms. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. I think, uh, Gaynell, maybe it was directed at you, Elsie, and then actually, Lucianne, I'm going to include you on this question because I know you had talked as well in your role on this uh, importance of the sensitization of the leadership of the Haiti National P Police. So, Gaynell, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think it's a, a very, very um, important question that you raise, one of resources. It's a, it's a challenging question for us. I think I'd, I'd start by saying that, uh, sort of commending really, the, um, the leadership of UNMIS, because it was the leadership that had the foresight, the vision, and I think the commitment to include in its budget for nine professional level WPAs, 2011, 2012. So we have that set and we were able to move with that. And I think, you know, perhaps we, we were a little bit privileged because the SRSG of, of uh, UNMIS used to be the coordinator of UN Action Against Sexual Violence. So she has that commitment. And um, not questioning really the commitment of others, but certainly highlighting her commitment. And, um, and we were able, I'm pleased to say that we were able to get those resources again um, put forward for the 2013-2014 um, budget, which we're very hopeful will be approved. So we will have those nine WPAs in UNMIS to continue doing that work. The picture doesn't look so rosy elsewhere, where, <clears throat> where missions have not um, adequately included in their budgets, or they have not included in their budgets at all. Um, WPAs. So we have the challenge of how do we actually get this work done. Now the, I mentioned the UN Action Against Sexual Violence and they are actually stepping forward to give some initial funding to support WPAs in um, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, um, perhaps Natalie you can remind me, Minuso, yeah. And uh, so we will have at least three I think going out with funding from the, the UN Action Against Sexual Violence. and. The key question there is where you asked, where, where do we place them? And that is a really valid question. And I was reminded to, that, that not, not, to, not to wear my, my human rights hat too broadly here today, because I'm a human rights person. And I want to say, mm -hmm. give them the human rights. But uh, that's a little bit unfair. And um, I think that we have to be really strategic and think about where we place these, because as I said earlier, there's no one fit all scenario. I think we have to assess on a case by case basis where these WPAs will be most effective. If I am to consider my role in UNMIS as the coordinator, I think that's a very crucial role because a lot of this work is already being done, as I said, and as you actually rightly pointed to, by our gender colleagues and by our human rights colleagues and other aspects of the mission, but they're not going that deeply, as deeply as we would hope WPAs are going. We expect WPAs to go into it. So there is a role for that coordinator to be, I, I think it would be good if we have a coordinator, senior coordinator that can advise and bring this issue constantly to the senior leadership so it doesn't slip off the radar. If we put them in human rights, they're, they're lost maybe as a human rights, another human rights officer covering a particular issue, not torture this time, but women protection, um, sexual violence. Um, if we put them in gender, same thing. It becomes just a very narrow, another gender issue. But when we place them, if we have one, I would say strategically place that one in the office of the SRA give it a very high level, a high status, advisory role in those senior, senior leadership meetings where they're actually bringing forward those issues. That person will have to work very closely with, with human rights, of course, and gender, to ensure that they get the, they get the accurate information coming in from the, the human rights country, um, um, team leaders in, in, in the states so that they can inform the leadership and ensure that these issues come forward a little bit more forcefully. We're in the process of, of, of considering how we will set up uh, missions, um, perhaps in Mali and, and, um, and Somalia and wanting in this first rollout to include WPAs. And the question again is, if we do have them, should we, how many should we have and where should, where should they go? And we're all around the tables wearing our, the table wearing our respective hats saying, certainly we want some in human rights because we want that monitoring to place, take place in Mali. We want that to take place in Somalia. We want to understand what the context is and to extend the nature of sexual violence in those particular countries. 
gender is also gender DPK is also saying the same thing. But I think to start out, we may be looking more like having that, uh, and of course the SRSG sexual violence is saying it, but we may be looking more at having that coordinator role in the senior WPA, so that we, as I said earlier, will will have that high level focus and, and, and advice advisory role to the to the senior mission leadership, and certainly we will be including including something in initially in the human rights sector with a view to maybe as we go in the second phase uh, of implementation, bringing some more into gender. So that's where we are right, right now. There is an issue of resources, and there is uh, we would would have wanted more of the missions to um, include it in their regular budget. They didn't. We need to see how we can actually raise additional resources um, for this process. I know the SRSG sexual violence has been doing a lot of um, advocacy, trying to get support on this issue. Um, when we had the C-34 uh, a couple of months ago, that issue of providing support uh, resources to uh, adequate resources to ensure that we get this work done and ensure that we actually implement the mandates was raised and I think it's it's important that we we keep that we keep hammering that in and, and certainly I'm, I'm hoping that it will come through tomorrow in our discussion with the at the area thank you okay so Elsie in order not to lose the last point um, which Curry raised I think that I would like to agree here with um, um, Mr. Kama, when he says that we should think about getting the work done instead of adding more coordination and top-heavy um, mechanisms to, to getting the work done. And I think we should go back to the drawing board. What does or what do the resolutions of the Security Council say about the Women Protection Advisors? I think it is clear, I mean, if we missed out on 1325 and 1888, I think 1960 brought it out very clearly that there should be um, women protection advisors in the human rights office and in the gender office. I think they made it very clear. Now, if the implementation is going away from the provisions of the Security Council resolutions, then it makes it a problem because the issue is in the field. We need women protection advisors to protect the women in the field. That is where it is. It is a field problem. It is not about adding somebody, another person, again, in the office of the SRSG. You know, the issue is strengthening the capacity of the, the human rights office and the gender office in making sure that they are able to, um, to analyze this protection issues on the ground and to report, you know, so that uh, adequate action can be taken. I do not see somebody in the secretary, in the office of the SRSG being able to report just by being in that office without working in the field on the ground where the problem is. I think that this is where we have to help the Security Council uh, in, 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 in taking the decisions. And they have made the decision and the implementation should not be reversed. That is my, my, my one comment. The next comment is that um, with regard to the difference between a WPA and a, 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 a gender advisor, I think the WPA is linked to protection, which is just one aspect of a gender advisor's work. The WPA is linked to protection, and the gender advisor is more the broader political aspect of women's participation, political participation in the peace building process. I think there is a major distinction there because uh, I, I, we have a broader role to play, and we, I had brought this out in my in my in my presentation, and I wouldn't rehash it. We have the broader political aspect of making sure that women are engaged in every aspect of peace building. Women Protection Advisor is engaged only in the one part of protection. I think that is the major dis dis uh, uh, distinction between uh, the two positions, but I mean, which are mutually reinforcing. And I think the idea of, of a women protection advisor was that they should be reporting, you know, to the gender office on the gender aspects of the civilian protection and making sure that uh, they, they, they are getting the right response in terms of prevention and responding to the issues that afflict women and girls in the field. And uh, in, in terms of um, 
the question that was raised about um, what can be done in uh, when the government has clearly acknowledged its weakness in terms of control. Um, that is where MONUSCO uh, comes in. But it is, it, I, I hate, because uh, our role is to support the government, the vision of the government. But when the government is not there, we're still obliged you know, to act, to support the civilians, to help them. And so we have these mobile courts, which I talked to you about, which are supported by the uh, Joint Human Rights Commission and also uh, the Gender Office. And we and civil society partners, we are engaged in help making sure that the communities are themselves aware and engaged in their own protection. And this is where I think that your, your, the work that you do has a merit, because we're supposed to be working with the communities themselves, strengthening them, and, and making sure that they are also agents of the behavior change that is needed you know, uh, to, to, for, to you know, promote their own protection. And um, it is a very difficult thing, more, easier, is more easily said than done, because when uh, a, an unarmed civilian is faced with, an, with armed groups, you know, you, you, you find yourself in a situation where you, 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 you are, you are in, a, in a situation of, of lack of strength. And so many things happen. That is why they take our, the, the children, forcefully graft them into the armies. That is why they rape with impunity. And that you know that the, the, the legal system is weak. Even people who have been judged and found guilty have managed to escape from prisons. The last time you heard, uh, before I came here, all the prisoners escaped from Dolo prison. It's a daily recurrence in, 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 in the DRC. And, and so uh, uh, it, it, is a, it is a very complex problem. And this is why we are hoping that, you know, with the intervention brigade that would wipe out that we could arrive at a situation where these uh, splinter groups could be wiped out completely so that uh, uh, the government can now come back to some of these places where it has lost control uh, to start to rebuild. And I think uh, uh, to do that, uh, uh, we need to work very closely with, with uh, even the churches. We have worked with them a lot, you know, and uh, 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 to, to try to see how you know, to bring about um, communities being engaged in, in their own protection. Uh, thank you, Elsie. And so, Lucienne, I want to uh, add you in, in to this series of questions, because from your work in Haiti and what you had talked, uh, talked about early, uh, er, this issue of your training program, it also involves sensitization of the leadership. So if you could talk about that a little bit. Thank you. Yes, uh, <clears throat> a few minutes ago, I said that it's one of the team goal was to provide space and offices to gender victims. Now, for the last month or so, we noticed that I rank officer, after a few visits, were taking the offices for their own personal, well, not personal, but for their own, <laughs> for their own uh, office. They were taking the furniture, they were taking the computers, filing cabinets, and everything. So this is, def this is defeating the purpose of our project. So after a uh, big meeting, as I can say, we decided to train and form also the high rank officer, since they weren't sensitized. So it's really important to promote and prioritize the SGBV, uh, not SGBV, the police officers' I ranks. Uh, since uh, we're starting all over again, we're turning around. So they have to be informed, they have to be sensitized. So we are planning ahead a five day course for the I rank officers. Thank you. So, some other questions. So, we'll take these three right here. And, and I'm sorry, but for a time, I think that'll have to be our last round of questions. Lucy, 
Lucy Webster from the um, Center for War Peace Studies, which is part of the World Federalist Movement. Um, I'd just like uh, someone to comment on um, when and how do things really get done? I mean, I appreciate the um, uh, subtlety of how one tries to influence pr the process and the attitudes, but is there any opportunity to um, sort of assert the, uh, the UN norms? Thank you, but I, uh, I won't be able to speak longly in English. If someone can help me to translate, because I'm speaking French, I'm from the DRC. Could you, um, could you introduce yourself? And if you can just keep I'm, your question. I, I'm Charlotte Malenga, the Minister Counselor in the DRC. Uh, DRC okay, the could keep your question brief. Hold on a second. It's not a question, but yeah. can right. I speak yes. in French? Je veux parler très brièvement. OK, ça va. OK. Euh, je, me, je remercie d'abord la MONUSCO pour euh, l'effort qu'elle est en train de faire de supporter mon gouvernement. <laughs> I would like to thank MONUSCO for the effort that they are making in supporting my government. Et j'apprécie beaucoup l'intervention de madame sur la RDC, ce qu'elle a dit est effectivement vrai. I would like to uh, 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 thank uh, Madame Elsie for the presentation that she made, because what she said was effectively true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, mais je voudrais un peu apporter. <laughs> je voudrais un peu apporter un petit complément de d'information à Madame qui a dit que le gouvernement de la République a dit qu'elle n'est pas au contrôle de, 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 des événements qui se passent et c'est inadmissible. C'est le terme qu'elle a expliqué, qu'elle a dit. Yes, and I would like to uh, underscore the remarks of my colleague to my left when she said that the government admitted that they are not in control of what is happening, which I think is um, intolerable. Mm -hmm. Euh, je voudrais dire que la RDC est un grand pays. Elle a 2 345 000 km2. Je voudrais dire que la RDC est un grand pays. Elle a 2 345 000 km2. Je voudrais dire que la RDC est un Yes. Uh, so I just have to ask you to be brief, so because we have one okay, more question okay. and then we uh -huh. need to give time for answers. Okay. Mm. Uh, je voudrais tout simplement dire que uh, la RDC uh, rencontre un problème d'infrastructure routière. C'est à ce point-là que nous disons que la RDC n'est pas en contrôle de ce pays parce qu'il y a des, des zones très uh, arriérées où les véhicules ne peuvent pas immédiatement euh, atteindre les populations. Les... C'est là où les groupes armés profitent, qui sortent de la forêt pour faire ce qu'ils veulent. Mm -hmm. I would like to also underscore the fact that because of the scope and the limited infrastructure of the DRC, um, it makes it easy for these uh, armed groups to survive because most of the places are are not at easily attainable, they are enclaved, and so they stay in the jungle there and they do exactly as they want. C'est ce qui explique un peu le non-contrôle de la situation. And that is what also explains the fact that the government is not in control mm. of the situation. So, so thank you, please. Thank you, merci. Merci. Huh? We have one more. Uh, Behind you. Was there one more person? And I'm that's thank all you we can much. for the comments and questions. Um, I would like to thank the panelists, as well as the IPI, for giving us um, this opportunity to have an insight mm -hmm. into what is happening in the field. Um, my name is Saidu Nalo from the Permanent Mission of Sierra Leone. Um, basically, uh, my concern here is about 
the firstly um, the legal structures instruments that have been in place in these uh, situations how strong are the legislations secondly which support is being given to law enforcement agencies in terms of like the question of uh, prison breaks how do you strengthen institutions to ensure that these do not um, uh, continue to be the, the trend. And then lastly, it seems that um, the work is being focused in government controlled areas. How do we take this beyond those areas? How do we reach out in areas that are beyond government control? Thank you very much. Okay, so since we're really close to time, I'm just gonna go across the panel and ask uh, the panelists uh, address the questions, any last comments, and also pe please be brief. Thank you. Elsie, you're first. I, I'm not sure I answered. Did you raise the question of how do you strengthen the judiciary? Ah, okay, fine. How we strengthen the judiciary at present is also to sensitize them on a, a gender analysis and how to uh, prevent and respond to sexual and gender-based violence, how to accompany the, 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 the victims. Uh, I would like to just say that there's a lot of this that we've done. In the last one year, we trained about 1,500 magistrates on, on, on this uh, prevention and response to sexual and gender-based violence. We encourage them to have a focal points that can link with us so that we can monitor more of what they do, where they have problems, and how they liaise with all the other parties that are concerned in, in the, um, uh, legal support uh, to victims. Uh, there's also an issue of mobilizing outside support, because I think that uh, these victims could well fall under the purview of the International Criminal Court. Uh, this is something which is mooted, but there has been no concrete uh, move that has been made. We are hoping that uh, Madam Robinson can help us to advocate for this, that the International Criminal Court treats some of these victims in the DRC as potential witnesses, and therefore they can look into their issues of access to psychosocial rehabilitation, access to re reparations, and this could help in the legal sense. But um, for the work of the, of, of, the, of the judiciary itself, we are trying to support them. You have heard that the, the MONUSCO has even built court houses. In some places, I went to Shabunda, uh, where they are supporting you know, uh, 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 the, the whole process. It is very financially intensive, uh, and, uh, but we, we are trying to support the government as best as we can in this. And, and I think that they are responding because we have cases now of even senior military official, officials that have been judged and, and condemned, you know. And so uh, uh, there is, and we're putting more pressure on the government more than ever before. You've heard the denouncements that have been made on the cases of rape in Goma and in Minova, and we are the investigations that MONUSCO is supporting the government uh, uh, magistrates to undertake with regard to these rape cases. And, and so there is um, movement. It has it's not reached the level, of course, that we want, but we need people like you, the civil society, to hold the government's feet to the fire for accountability in these matters, especially the judiciary. Okay, Genel? Okay. Um, I actually wanted to just follow up quickly on something uh, that, that was said with regard to the, the placement of the WPAs. I mean, the, the, the reality is we would want them all to be in the field. As we have in South Sudan, the majority of the WPAs are operating at state level. They're not at headquarters. They're not in the, as we say, the over excessive uh, coordinating. But when we have limited resources and when we have only one WPA, the question is where do we put them? Do we put them in gender? Is that the most effective place to put them? Do we put them in human rights? Do we put them in a more coordinating role? We have to be strategic in how we do that because the reality is we have limited resources. Ideally, we would want them in all three 
areas, and ideally we would want them to be out there on the ground investigating and protecting, because at the end of the day, this is really about the victims. And the closer we are to, vic to the victims, and I completely agree with you, we do that by going to the field and we can ensure greater protection. I actually wanted to also um, just attempt um, to respond to your um, rather large question <laughs> about how do we assert the UN norms. And um, I, I will, through the, through the lens of my WPA um, hat that I wore back then um, in South Sudan, what we did is to, and, and we did this, we, we had a, a major training very early, um, soon after I arrived there. And we brought in colleagues from Geneva, colleagues from um, New York, um, uh, to really share with those colleagues who are working on this issue what we actually mean by international, what we actually mean by um, conflict related sexual violence and what that means in international and international human rights law and international humanitarian law. And one, so the whole, the whole premise on which we build that uh, training is to say that we have to work from these basic standards and norms. We're not here to develop something new on our own. What we're doing is seeing how those, those international standards, legal standards and norms, can apply in this particular setting, in this particular state, in this particular village in South Sudan, and what that actually means. So the premise of it is really, um, how do we apply, how do we apply um, the, the human rights treaties? How do we apply the, the Geneva Conventions with respect to international crimes? And we know that um, conflict-related sexual violence can indeed be an international crime. And, um, and, and we can talk about sanctions against states or parties for use of, 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 of um, uh, conflict related sexual violence. So this, of course, we, ha we can only get to that level if we ensure that we use the internationally accepted legal norms and standards. And so it is based on that. And so that's, it, it doesn't come out every day. You don't always see how you can speak about it on your day-to-day -day work. But you know that as you are doing it, you're doing it based on these particular norms and standards. I hope that gives you a little bird's eye view into how we, how we operate on this issue. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Ganel. The general said he'd pass on closing remarks. Do you have any other closing? I'll pass off. I okay. Think has been said. Okay. Thank all of you. And I think that this discussion has shown that there's a range of issues and a depth to this topic. And so we certainly will uh, keep this in mind as we continue with our uh, Women, Peace, and Security series. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>